mission of Shield AI is to protect service members and civilians with intelligence systems. At the core of this company, we are always thinking about how to use AI to protect people and to deter conflict. America and its allies and companies like Shield AI are building remarkably incredible technologies that are moving incredibly rapidly to be able to respond to growing threats nationwide. It is absolutely a time of growing tensions geopolitically. Obviously, the, the war in Ukraine is ongoing, uh, the war in Gaza, uh, escalating tensions in the Middle East, escalating tensions in the Taiwan Strait, escalating tensions around North Korea. There is absolutely a race for AI superiority taking place right now. The winner of the race to develop autonomous systems will have massive battlefield advantages. If that is the case, and uh, the nation state that develops such capabilities uh, is not one that is aligned with our values, they will use those systems in ways that are diametrically opposed to U.S. interests, that are diametrically opposed to the rule of law. It's absolutely critical that the U.S. and Western democracies uh, continue to win the race around this. So for the last 30 years, we've existed largely in a geopolitical state where the U.S. has been the primary global power and where obedience to the rule of law, international norms, has, has been the ruling order of the day. There have always been other countries who have uh, different views of the world and views of the world that are diametrically opposed to that. Um, and I think we've seen over the last uh, 10 years or so continued willingness from those countries to act in that regard. I think we've seen this from Russia and from China, uh, North Korea, Iran. So these have all been bubbling under the surface for the last 30 years, uh, but we're seeing it now in a much more uh, profound and forward way that we have in the past. So it's, it has always been there. The situation hasn't fundamentally changed, but it is certainly more pronounced. The, the U.S.'s vision uh, around the world order uh, is based on, it is based on the rule of law. It is based on democratic values. It is based on equity. It is based on open commerce. Uh, it is based on global growth. The view of the world uh, that we see from some other countries right now, really you need to think about in terms of the particular regimes. So uh, in China, in Russia, in North Korea, in Iran, the global order that they want to promote is the one that benefits purely the existence of those regimes, which in some ways is, is diametrically opposed uh, to the world order that the U.S. has been maintaining for you know, since World War II in some ways, and certainly, certainly since the end of the Cold War. China desires a world order that's built on the Chinese Communist Party's control uh, of both their nation uh, and of uh, economic lines of communication around the globe. So very, very in-depth control by the Chinese Communist Party uh, of other nation states, of how they do trade, and I think you see similar things with Russia and Iran as well, although different uh, in their own ways. In a world where Iran or China or Russia achieved their global ambitions, uh, I think we would see breakdown in the international norms and rules of law that we've become accustomed to, which includes a very open global trade, which has enabled the massive improvements to quality of life that we've seen. Uh, over the last several decades. I think we would see a lack of respect for territorial boundaries. I think we would see lack of respect for human rights and an, an overall degradation uh, in the quality of life globally, frankly. Uh, so the, the stakes are really, truly incredibly high. SHIELD was founded in 2015. It was founded by Brandon Sang, who is a former Navy SEAL. His brother, Ryan Sang, who is a serial entrepreneur. It was founded in 2015. Brandon had uh, come out of the Navy and had experienced many missions as a Navy SEAL in which, in which he believed that lives could have been saved if they had been accompanied by artificial intelligence on the battlefield. And he and Ryan and Andrew set out to create a company that would build, engineer products that would, at the end of the day, serve and help service members and civilians with these intelligence systems. So looking back at the start of the global war on terror, most of the, the systems that we were fielding were fundamentally incredibly rudimentary robots in that sense. So fully remote controlled, um, operated directly by a human who is uh, actuating uh, each individual joint on the robot in order to say, uh, deliver an explosive charge or investigate a package. We are now seeing massive shifting there, which is uh, where Shield AI uh, is putting all of our technology focus in terms of actually putting 
autonomy on those systems and putting autonomy on the edge uh, such that it is not just a human operator at a ground control station who has some amount of autonomy and some amount of intelligence support from an AI system on the ground control station, but that the autonomy is actually on the edge operating on the aircraft itself. So to understand what an autonomous weapon uh, really is, you kind of have to understand what autonomy is and how it can be used as a weapon. So autonomy, and as a core concept, is actually kind of easy for humans to understand because we do this every day. And there's a three-step step process to understand what the system is doing. So for an autonomous capability, the really what we're looking for is how does the system operate without direct human intervention? And so how to actually enable that with software, you have to understand how a human does that themselves. So first they use their sensors, their eyes, their ears to understand what the world looks like, the perception. And then you think about what you actually want to accomplish. So I want to go to the store and buy something, or I want to go and tie something up and send a message. So you have an idea about what you want, and then you think about, okay, here's what the world looks like, here's what I want to accomplish, and I think about what I want to do to actually accomplish those. So we call that cognition. And then when you understand what the world looks like, what you want to do, you actually have to then act. And so that's the action phase. So autonomy is really that loop of perceiving the world, thinking about it, and then doing it. And so if you think about that in the context of an autonomous weapon, it's a, it's a system that can cause harm, that can do this without direct human intervention by going through that process. So militaries want to use autonomous weapons for many different reasons, but primarily it is a, main, a means to do two things. One is to reduce the risk to their force, because instead of sending a person with that weapon manually to interact with the enemy forces, they can instead send a system to do that and re reduce that risk to that person's life. Second is to scale. So in terms of military, our ability to operate is very limited based on the number of people that we have. If you can instead have systems to do that instead, you can now scale through production rather than recruiting a human to do the same kind of job. So it's really those ability to reduce risk to the force and to scale the operations. The modern battlefield is a remarkably dynamic remarkably dangerous place. It is no longer the case that you can rely on your communication systems working. It is no longer the case that you can rely on your DS systems working. It is no longer the case that you can count on your communications not being intercepted. It is no longer the case that you will absolutely have air superiority to support the troops on the ground. So while it was already the case that the battlefield of the global war on terror was a remarkably dangerous place with a, a host of threats, it is now absolutely the case that the, the combat environment being seen by troops currently surpasses anything that we've seen in recent history. The mission of SHIELD AI from then and now is to protect service members and civilians with intelligence systems. And the first mission that they did was how do you clear buildings? Because until that, at that point in time, in the middle of the 2010s, the most dangerous mission that these service members were accomplishing and what really compelled Brandon to create SHIELD AI was building clearance. Party. Those missions in which special operations team and teams enter buildings have incredibly high casualty rates. If you could imagine basically one person opening a door and you don't know what's on the other side of the door, there's not a lot you can do in that situation uh, to protect yourself if you don't know what's there. We were going and sending these brave young service members into buildings blind because we needed to know what's happening inside. We had to clear to make sure there was no explosive devices. But before, there was no way you could do that. You could send remotely piloted aircraft or you could send ground robots. They would lose connection though, as soon as they walked through that door. And so there was no currently able to do that. And so they came together and created Nova One, which is the first deployed autonomous system, a quadcopter that can actually go into buildings and perform the surveillance before for the operator. And so now you have service members that can step far away, send a robot through and get that situation awareness, go through that, that tunnel, go through that doorway and not actually have to risk themselves. There was a lot of interest from Special Operations Command at that, at that time. And of course, because of the type of mission that the quadcopter was accomplishing. And we're super proud of that mission. I think the cool thing about an AI pilot is that it can be put onto any type of hardware. That software is not just unique and important for that quadcopter, that software is really something that can power any sort of aerial platform. And the mind was what, the, that was a really important part of it. And that's how we created HiveMind. So what is HiveMind? HiveMind is the world's best AI pilot. It's the software system that enables advanced capabilities at the edge 
and it's the ecosystem in which we develop those capabilities, as well as the user interface, which our operators interact with to actually task and, and interact with these uh, autonomous capabilities. So a, a lot of times I think people are worried, they hear AI pilot and they're worried about who is making the decisions, who is calling the shots in critical situations. And so that is the most valid question perhaps of all. And, and we totally agree with the thought process there. The way that we think about it is called human in or on the loop. So a human is on the decision-making loop that the AI pilot is involved, is involved in, is, in, is making on its mission. The human will essentially task the AI pilot to do something, go search that area, go look for, you know, mines in that part of the ocean. And the AI pilot will execute the commander's intent. That's how we think about it, always executing commander's intent. It will go and accomplish that mission and come back. It can accomplish that mission without constant piloting but it will accomplish the mission that it has been told to do. And so, you know, that is, I think, the most basic tenet of the ethical principles that we imbue in our AI pilot, that the Department of Defense imbues in its AI and ethical principles, is to always ensure that a human is the one that is gonna make the ultimate decision um, on what that AI pilot is doing. Looking at the war in Ukraine right now, it's abundantly clear that the modern battlefield fundamentally is not a survivable place for a manned system. Uh, so overall air superiority, frankly, has not been achieved in Ukraine uh, and is a remarkably dangerous place for manned aircraft to fly. But the same would be true uh, in a variety of other places where uh, enemy air defenses are incredibly advanced. It is absolutely expected that, sur that the survivability of current platforms against modern enemy air defenses uh, would be incredibly low, which is why it's so important to create AI pilots who are able to move the fight in closer to where the enemy's at, be able to suppress enemy air defenses, and then allow for manned systems to conduct the missions that the, they typically do in order to provide support for ground forces. So this, there's been unmanned air vehicles for a long time. And what's really cool about a VBAT is that it's not only unmanned, but it's autonomous. There are many ways to deny aerial platforms access to a region. And you can see this happening right now in Ukraine. And the two primary mechanisms are through communication and GPS denial. So going back to that autonomy loop of perception, cognition, action, robot, in order for it to be able to, act, to operate or even any sort of system, it has to know where it is in the world. And so one of the common ways that enemies and bad actors reduce your ability to operate is to take away GPS. So for example, on your phone, GPS tells you where you are in the world. If you don't have GPS, you suddenly can't use your maps. You can't locate yourself. You can't direct yourself anywhere. And similarly, you can, using electronic warfare, disrupt the ability of the aircraft to receive those GPS signals, and now suddenly it has to operate blind. So autonomy can come in and actually enable it to do so by using cameras, using your eyes, using other sensors, similar to how humans can operate without GPS by simply observing their environment. And so it has complementary modalities, sensor modalities that are able to then allow it to operate in there. And similarly for communications. So right now, every existing UAV up till now has needed to have a direct communication line to the user in order to deploy. Because as soon as the user cannot talk to it, they no longer can fly, some disturbance happens, and it ends up crashing. And that's really a common, a common occurrence uh, in this past century and even, even nowadays. And so VBAT is very unique in that it has that autonomous capability to understand, hey, I'm being jammed right now. I'm not be able to talk to my user. Here are the steps I could take to recover this. I either accomplish the mission, and the ability to accomplish missions is one of those core capabilities of being autonomous, and it's able to then return to the user on its own. So now you can recover aircraft that have gone into these dangerous jammed areas. In 2022, the US ran a test in simulation of how AI swarm drones can prevent an invasion of Taiwan from China. And they did that to understand the scale that's required for these systems to operate and to provide the information required to be able to have US current military forces help and as well as Taiwanese military forces help and prevent a, a particular invasion. And they're very valuable to do run these kind of simulations to understand what capabilities are required and what information is required and how this infrastructure can be set up to help prevent such an invasion. So VBAT teams can help prevent a invasion into Taiwan by providing a really rich and detailed understanding of what's happening across the border of Taiwan to make sure that if any, any forces were tried to 
enter Taiwan, we will know immediately and be able to target that vessel without them getting it too far. And so VBAT teams is a collaborative group of VBATs that can operate together to accomplish more and more challenging missions and inc at increased levels of resilience because of that redundancy built in. The fact that there is not just one, but there's four, five, hundred, four hundred in the future VBATs operating together, you can now lose one or two or lose a couple hundred even and still be able to accomplish that overall mission. So there's been incredible investment across the globe to fund the development of autonomous systems for military applications, not just from the U.S. and not just from Western democracies, but also from China and Russia and Iran and North Korea. We've seen the fielding of some of these weapons uh, in Ukraine. We've seen the fielding of uh, some of these weapons in the greater conflict that's rising uh, in the Middle East. But every major power right now is providing substantial funding in the direction uh, of autonomous systems for the battlefield. And frankly, it's because it is commonly understood that the advantage that nation states will have from having a more superior AI pilot is simply that dominant, and that profound, that continuing to fund these lines of effort is seen as absolutely critical by all of these nation states. The future of war with AI pilots, with Shield AI AI pilots, I think is a very inspiring place. Again, I think we can, you can put an AI pilot on, on anything, on any platform. You can one day, you know, force structure of the future, you can have AI pilots on, on planes, on all, the, on all drones, on, on basically any aircraft you can think of. And you do that because you're scaling the ability of our military to hold to the principles that it has been built with. In 2030 might be the same number or less humans involved, but with a massively scaled AI capability that has been built, again, with those moral and ethical principles that we hold so dear. And um, I think it's an exciting place because that scales our, our military capability. And what that really does in the end is deters conflict in a world where having the best capability, the best military capability, is what keeps anyone from wanting to fight. What scares me about AI warfare is other bad actors developing technologies without their appropriate guardrails and having a lot of unintended consequences because of those actions, having an unnecessary loss of life, being used in the wrong hands. How do we combat that? How do we address fears of that happening? The way that the Department of Defense, the United States, have built the ethical principles that drive our artificial intelligent tools are the principles that allow a chain of command. It will execute commander's intent. It will do what the human has requested of it. And so you make sure that our military, our leaders, everyone that is, that is executing is able to do so at the ethical standards that we hold of ourselves. There's many different many different ways to misuse these technologies and you need appropriate guardrails in order to make sure they are used appropriately because they can provide a lot of benefit that you should be developing these but with the right guardrails in place. And so what excites me as an engineer is the challenge of that as having those foundational ethical principles on which to build upon these capabilities. Actually reminds me of a, of a Kennedy quote from the space race. We choose to do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And it is a challenge that I think we are responsible for doing because it is right. My hope is that we accomplish our mission of protecting service members and civilians with intelligent systems. I, I truly be believe that the, the greatest victory requires no war. And I really want our systems to be the reason why there is no future conflicts. And I believe that warfare happens because there's asymm asymmetry. There is a power that believes that they can win over the others, others in the world. And I believe if we are the ones that are going to be at the top and have that dominance that makes it impossible for others to act, we can maintain that goal of security.